Welcome, Noel. Thanks for joining us. Uh, well, thank you, Tony, and um, thank you to Manawa um, for getting me started on a, a very interesting career. And I think Manu talked yesterday about Manaki Tanga, and I always felt uh, to Manawa it was a very welcoming place, um, as was Palmerston North. And in fact, my second daughter, Frances, uh, was born in this city, so I have a very close association with it. Now, just to stay with the theme of this hooey. Peter Jackson's going to do a fine job with it. Um, well, I sort of re-changed the title of this, the subtitle, to There and Back Again, um, in the sense that I did start uh, my career in the museums at Te Manawa. Um, I had done exhibitions before, but um, it became a really important place for me to think about, um, I suppose, increasingly about exhibition design um, rather than curatorship, although I took that role um, very seriously. But I thought, in terms of design, I should at least provide one definition of design, and it's probably my favourite one by Herbert Simon. Uh, it says, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, um, as Herbert Simon said, everyone is a designer. Now, design is often quite the second half, but not the first half, but um, I think everyone who contributes um, to museums, um, galleries, and science centres is a creative person and is involved in some form of design if they're trying to improve uh, what they're doing. Um, it's quite interesting too that Herbert Simon is not, in fact, a designer, but a Nobel Prize winning economist who wrote uh, a landmark book called The Sciences of the Artificial, recognising the importance of design. Um, so basically I've divided this talk into three parts, and the first is exploration. Um, and it's quite ironic because when we went to Barista last night, we had those marvellous menus. Uh, and I was a bit of a book geek, you know, I couldn't help, but I got started getting into the Encyclopaedia Britannica. And um, my first section was actually called Exploration. Uh, so for me, arriving and signing up for the job of Curator Social History, uh, and to find that we had been rebranded as Tamanua, and suddenly I became Curator of Life. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is good. <laughs> um, and I actually vividly remember, I think, my first or second day on the job working with um, Pamela Lovis on the exhibition called Animalia, based on the children's book. And I was coming up in the lift with a large brown bear from Te Papa, And I thought, well, it can't get stranger than this. Um, so I want to sort of explore a little bit of that brand. And um, we took it very seriously. As you can see, um, this was our Kilroy was there, as soon as the sign went up we got up onto the roof and hopefully there's no health and safety people in the room, but uh, it seemed to us a good idea and we tried to position ourselves over our various fields, life, art and mind, uh, myself, Kate and Bettina, who are all quite new here, but we're really excited about the possibilities of joining these three areas together. Um, and then, of course, Detlef inserted himself in the middle as the conservator, you know, sort of <laughs> saying, so, you know, there is the golden rule, as I recall, uh, about how we um, conserve, preserve, which is a very important part of what museums do, uh, but our other job is to make that accessible to the general public. Um, and seeing there was a little bit of talk, which I think is this one. Uh, well, the, the brand interested me as well. Um, in the sense that um, I, I teach communication design now and we, we talk about brand identity and there's an excellent book by Adrian Forty, quite an old book called Objects of Desire where he looks at one of the most iconic brands in the world which is the London Underground and how 
a, a bunch of separate transport companies were amalgamated under this unique brand in London. And he said there's two uh, roles for a brand. One is to internally cohere an organisation, to pull people together you know, with a common language and a common ground. And the other is to present a unified front to the public. And I, I really felt that this brand, uh, the Tamanua brand, really did that. And I, I was present at the presentation from the very young designer from the design firm who gave it. And I, I vividly remember him because he was quite a, a young man. And he had the three senior executives who, as a design firm, all wore black and stood at the back of the room. Uh, well, he gave this presentation and he clearly really, really engaged um, with the city and what the museum and the art gallery and the Science mm -hmm. Central did. And my first job, and this was, uh, hey, thanks to Warren Warbrook for letting me do it, um, was to do a wee uh, thing called brand identity. And the first th object I wanted to get was a brand. You know, I wanted to get one of those cow brands that um, still had some cow flesh on it. Because there was, you know, <laughs> I've been through a few uh, organisations with restructuring and rebranding, and it can be a painful experience mm -hmm. as well. Um, but, you know, I got to dig around in each of the collections and I remember finding that marvellous Tamuka plate at the Manawatu Art Gallery there and um, John Bevan Ford's um, image and, and one of the construction helmets on at the original film. So it was a way for me to kind of dive into the collection to look backwards as we created a present brand that would carry us forward um, uh, for the future. And I did... <coughs> I was quite interested in the design process of the designer, and I, I got this off, off the designer um, because he was very good in that he had gone through a number of iterations for the design, and he'd thought about it on a number of levels, and when a number of staff asked him particular questions about why this brand, what was it doing, he could pull out his process work, which is an excellent strategy. Often designers don't show you all the work they do to create something because that's that sort of done and finished, but he you know, took us through the various steps and how he uh, tried to bring you know, three institutions that had their own unique identities and, and strong heritage within the region and how they could be brought together. And the metaphor, of course, um, is um, flat and that weaving together, which we heard about yesterday and how important it is to weave together various elements, but also various elements within our communities. And that's what we got. We got, we got, you get brand, you get brochures, you get names, you get logos. But that to me was the most important part, was how did we integrate those, you know, the, if I can use the point, I think, those bits in the middle where it crosses over. And I guess it was that one in the middle that really interested me. Um, they all had their own practices and um, understandings of their field and knowledge within it. Um, and I think we were very enthusiastic to find that middle common ground. Um, but then we uh, realised that it wasn't going to be a quick thing, um, that those practices and understandings that people bought from various fields didn't necessarily naturally fit together. And I remember doing a history exhibition and saying to Kate, saying, well, you've got that great painting, we could stick it on the wall. And I shouldn't have, I should never have said stick it on the wall, you know, just that sort of, well, we'll slap a bit of art in there. And we, she said, right, we're going to talk about this. And it was like, right, so how are we going to, you know, again, weave these three threads together in a way that um, maintains the integrity of where they came from? Um, and generally, I guess, the place that that happens is with people. was a tribute to Manu uh, because he did talk yesterday about that particular whakatauki and the importance of people, um, the people, the people, the people. And I guess that was driven home to me and I think this was one of the first 
exhibitions I worked on, which was Tarito to Harakiki. And I guess that's when I found out that there were part of Harakiki around the museum. I was new to Palmerston North, I'd never been here before. Um, I got drawn into, you know, I guess, the history of uh, flax and Harakiki um, over hundreds of years within the region. And I guess this is where we started to bring in perhaps a little bit of science um, because there was some great research going on um, at Massey into um, uh, forming 10 or uh, Harakiki. And we also had some obviously magnificent collection items and uh, I vividly remember Warren Walbrook um, showing me the Korowai and explaining the process that went on behind it. And we also had these magnificent photographs of the flax bush and again, it, you know, they're so uh, ubiquitous in New Zealand, um, there's different varieties and species up and down the country, but you know, it's one of those things you take for granted perhaps um, if you're not intimately involved in them, but what a beautiful plant they are, and that stunning photograph. I also learned you know, my first lesson in exhibition design when Warren was largely responsible for the installation here, and I, I didn't like the colour scheme actually, and I didn't want to say anything because I was newly arrived, and then he turned the lights down, and I realised the importance of light and ambience and how it can create an atmosphere in a space and he'd, he'd anticipated that of course and I hadn't. Um, and uh, the only thing I didn't learn of course was how to take photographs without a flash. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and conservation lighting hence that terrible photograph. Um, the next exhibition was um, this one on Scots migrants. There'd already been a number of uh, migrant exhibitions at the to my, uh, prior to my arrival, and this was my first experience with a community exhibition. And I guess it, it worked out, I think, remarkably well. We found three or four, what I might call now, key stakeholders in the community, but people who were very generous with their time. And I vividly remember going down to a certain Scottish bar and having conversations with people, and people would come in and meet us, and you know, finding that kind of not the bars are always need to be the central point in the community, but you know that was one way for us to get into this um, into this community. And um, but we also had um, this remarkable um, notebook from the surveyor, John Tuffles. Yeah, and you know it was a beautiful object, and I've always loved books, but books are very difficult to display. You, know, you can only ever have you know those two pages, and this is a diary with notes and magnificent illustrations and we created this wee video which was um, one one image of his journey so his journey from um, Britain to New Zealand and he'd drawn it as a wee map and there were little scenes and we could just run a single video and it was only about 20 seconds long but that was a marvellous way to capture that story and then you know we could then show his you know, impressions on arrival um, in New Zealand and you know that was just one of the wee Parts. And there was another story which I recounted yesterday about a certain Scottish woman who some people will know here, who when I asked her, I said, well, you know, you're Scottish, um, have you got anything to contribute to the exhibition? And she looked at me and she said, uh, you could put me in a case if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, right, okay, well, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> that was what I came to know as a very dry Scottish wit. Um, but I guess the other thing is, uh, yeah, I, I, my grandmother came from Les Mahago in 1909 to New Zealand and I've never really kind of thought much about my family background and where I come from. I tend to live very much in the present and I'm interested in the future. Uh, but I got to go back to Scotland in 2010 and suddenly a lot of those connections and some of the things that I thought about Scotland, particularly I think maybe some of the criticisms that we might have had with this exhibition about it being a little bit too much say tartanry or you know that, that sort of stereotypical view of Scottish people um, and when I got to Scotland there was a lot of argument about that too with the sort of nationalist movement there and um, people you know wanting to create a new 21st century identity identifying with this but parts of it they were a bit sick of particularly the bits the tourists brought in uh, or want to see and uh, but again it came down to what the community wanted represented and, and I did feel this was one where you really had to stand back and say, well, if that's what you want, that's the story you want to tell, and that, that's the story you can tell. Um, I, yeah, it was again about just letting go of a little bit of control. Um, this one, Deep Lift will remember, good batch, easy living. Um, this was, uh, I think, some road trips to pick up some material, and I got quite 
obsessed with the batches, um, or what we call crimps in the South Island, and south of the Waitaki anyway, um, batches out on the coastline there, and thought it would make a really interesting subject because you know the coastal area is being developed, there's change going on, but there's these remarkable little buildings that as we found out, existed because there was a loophole in the planning laws that was removed in the 80s, but if you lived in a house for less than uh, 30 days, um, you were exempt from all building requirements, which means you could build it yourself, it didn't have to comply, and you could put these cheap little places up. But what came about was a remarkable conversation, I think, initiated uh, by Detlef uh, with Wendy Neal, who was teaching at UCOL and teaching furniture design. And she said, you know, I would, I need a, I would love to have a project that our students could design for within a certain context, within a certain brief that she'll set, and we could exhibit it at the museum. And we thought, well, great, that, that's perfect, because the, there was enough in the backstory, but maybe not enough to fulfil an exhibition. And this was a way of building a relationship with UCOL, uh, getting some students involved who hadn't been into the museum and, and seeing a bit of the collection. I remember we tried to interest them in caravans. They probably got freaked out about how to build <laughs> Um, at that kind of scale. So we displayed their furniture, sort of outdoor, easy living furniture, and had a photography competition um, sponsored by the local <coughs> uh, photography shop where people took photographs of these badges. So we, we created a wee record um, of uh, this um, sort of summer living, if you like. Now this one, some people will remember, um, it was the Sappers exhibition. Now this was a very large scale exhibition and I remember you know, hearing that there were one or two items out at Linton that we needed to have a look at. And uh, we went out to see this most remarkable uh, museum that, that completely blew me away in terms of uh, what was on display. And I'll admit now, I'm a, I am a bit of a pacifist and I had some reservations about doing this exhibition. But when I saw not only the history, but also the current practices, all those things that uh, you know, the peacekeeping, uh, and I loved uh, the wee slogan they had of a weapon of mass construction, um, which seemed to me really interesting. There was a real people story there because it, it is as a, used as a teaching museum to a degree, is it not? For, yeah. So, you know, th th this is an in use museum um, talking about the history and heritage um, and the sort of things that Glenn Harper does. Um, and we created an exhibition, and it was basically a wealth of resources, really. It was how, how could we. You know, tell some of those stories in the, what really small spaces here. Um, but again, I thought it was really important to build that relationship uh, of support because Tamanu always had a mandate as a regional museum to support other museums, and, and I thought this was another good way we could build into the community and into Linton as a township. Um, and um, again, you know, like, the army is a bit like museums to some people. It's, it's, it's something they know about, but it might be a little bit hidden. And, and so our job was to discover that and bring it to the fore. Um, I also vividly remember the conclusion having one of the most marvellous barbecues on Linton Base, where I'm sure I ate an entire cow. Um, and I thought, well, if this is how they eat in the army. Um, uh, this was another exhibition here on Kawawo um, and Nauru. And, and I guess I, I didn't really have that much to do with this other than to facilitate it um, and just just that case you can see behind the, the panel at the back there showing the drills um, and the making of Kawawo and the various implements to create them and I think that case well, it looks a bit if there's a shadow it's a bit close to the wall but I remember having a discussion with Warren about this and how you know, he's a, he's a maker and a player and when he sees these objects in museums he actually wants to get behind them and you know, see various aspects of them and he hated the cases being up against the wall but, and, and again we were sort of looking at, you know, we were again thinking about the scientific, the, uh, because this was an anthropological exercise or ethnomusicology I think, um, started by the remarkable Rob Thorne <coughs> who arrived in my office having begun this research at Massey and having a little bit of difficulty because it was interdisciplinary in terms of where it sat and he, he said doing the research, doing his masters, wanted to work with Warwick, and that uh, you know, there could be an exhibition in it. And I just said, well, we've got an empty office here <laughs> next to mine. So you go in there, you work, work this out. And um, they, they put together uh, an exhibition. I, I got the photos off them, but I never got to see it. But this one, um, I thought, was a really important breakthrough in that I think this came from Manu. Uh, this was about education and him wanting to take Toreo classes through the exhibition and wanting the entire exhibition in Te Reo. 
and um, it, as designers there's a thousand different solutions to that but a lot of them can be quite complicated and quite expensive and I think it was Paolo who came up with this if I recall um, you know, very simple, I the, the key image there and the, the board just slides across so when Manu took his Tarea class we could cover the English and he could go through uh, with all the text in Māori. Equally, if the kids are anything like me when I learn languages, they could crib, they could slide them across, there's a little bit of interactivity and they could read, and equally you could set it up for an English language, people who would actually have to slide it across and go, well, I don't understand Māori, so what's English? And, and I thought that was just a really simple, elegant solution, which, which I just showed to my students this year. We work on a, 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 an app for Te Reo with Te Tumu Māori um, and Indigenous Studies at Otago. Uh, for beginner learners, and, and I said, well, here's a very simple solution. They came up with much more gaming-oriented ways um, to learn languages. Right, well, this is where I shift back down um, to Otago, and, and I, I left here very, very reluctantly, I must say. In fact, I went to take, apply for the job with no intention of taking it, um, because I was really enjoying Te Manawa, and, and, and I, I could see the potential of, you know, what was possible here. Um, but then when I went and did my interview and realised that I actually do quite like teaching um, and that I guess I got drawn back, back to education. But I did take a lot of stuff with me and one of the first things I suppose possibly inspired by museum studies and, and their, having their students coming into this facility and doing an exhibition, I wanted to do the opposite and yeah, well take our students out and work with various cultural institutions in Dunedin and we're very lucky. And, We've got a number that are relatively close at hand, uh, the Hocken, um, the uh, Toy Two Settlers Museum, Otago Museum, Port Chalmers Maritime Museum, Archives New Zealand, uh, Public Library, um, Dunedin Public Art Gallery. And I started off, I got a bit complicated, but I started off quite simple where I gave them a single object to design an exhibition for, because I think that was what they allowed me to do when I arrived. Um, <laughs> just you know, one object, and this, this student took this object, which uh, no, it was actually the poster, uh, from Broadsheet Magazine, and she incorporated uh, Broadsheet Magazine, um, and then found out that the, the person who'd done both this cover and this poster was Vanya Lowry, um, who printed a number of books. I think the other image is uh, Kate Shepard on the $10 note, and then we got to Barbie and Girlfriend, and there was this really sort of interesting transition as people, you know, this is, I guess, the late 90s, you know, early 2000s view of a 20 year old's uh, version of feminism. Um, but again, you know, some quick, simple mock-ups and prototypes like this one to, to, to talk about, you know, just one one object, I mean, quite an important one in the social history of New Zealand in terms of uh, broadsheet uh, being quite a landmark feminist publication, um, but how they could represent that um, as a design project. This was another one that, you know, again, uh, this early bit of viral marketing. Um, we called it, it's not about trees of the queen. Um, it was just two projects, individual projects. Uh, one that looked at what if New Zealand became a republic. Um, and she was in fact a design and law student, absolutely you know, loved constitutional law, tried to convince all her friends. It was a fascinating subject and there was this really interesting debate. And they said, ah, you know, who cares? What, what's, what is it about the constitution? And what, you know what's the significance of the Treaty of Waitangi, and what would happen if it became a republic? Um, so that's um, it's not about the Queen; <laughs> it was about the nation and our constitutional arrangements. And the other one was by Genevieve um, Sylvester, uh, who was doing clothing and textiles and conservation. And I, asked, I said, "Well, can you do an exhibition that tells people who don't know what conservation is what conservation is?" And um, she did that, and that's where that integrating conservation and design exhibition came on. And she subsequently got one of the AMP scholarships and went to the Courtauld Institute to study um, design. And um, Helen, who did the Constitutional Review, was two years as a designer at Otago Museum and is now a barrister in Queenstown. So, uh, you know, again, that sort of melding of disciplines. Um, and this is one, I guess, that most people in museums are familiar with, the scene before the exhibition. Um, this is a group project about working with Trade Aid, uh, their trade organisation. And we, the, the students have done such a great amount of work, we wanted to have an, a very small sort of celebratory exhibition. And I had a colleague who was on leave and her office was empty. 
so we took it over. Uh, <laughs> we cleaned it up before she got back. Um, and, you know, the students got right in. One of the things they looked at were the coffee sacks that fair trade use and that there must be other uses for those. Um, so we started cutting them up, making them into posters. Um, uh, we created a mannequin. We didn't have the resources on one of those fine conservation status mannequins. We had some sort of shop window and she's attaching a wee bit of foam cord to its shoulder to give it a bit of shoulder pads there. That's shown. And then right there we gave her a hat because the woman was a bit bald and that, that t-shirt was kind of the summary and came right at the end. And we were trying to work out what it was about fair trade and they said it was just. You know, it was just in the sense of fair, but they also had the thing about, you know, just one cup of coffee, you know, just one of those purchases might make a difference. Um, and of course we had chocolate, which was good. Um, and then in design, we've always got like, like these walls just full of process, you know. This is to show that there's a lot of work that comes behind these designs. Um, and a lot of thinking, too, across a, a wide range of subjects. I started to formalise this after trying working with various institutions in Dunedin to work particularly with the Hocken um, Library or Gallery, and which is a remarkable institution. I mean, it's just a fantastic resource of New Zealand specific, um, archives and manuscripts, as well as um, a, a great art collection, and they have galleries upstairs. And this was our first one. I just found some dental health posters from the 1940s and 50s. And um, so we set up this exhibition, and there was five students working on this. Um, and we worked very closely with the dental health service at the medical school and things were going swimmingly. We found this remarkable chair, I don't know if anyone in the room remember this from school dental <laughs> clinics, but it's actually a New Zealand design, you know, it's a portable chair uh, designed for moving around classrooms and it was only, you know, we borrowed the object that, that I realised that. And then we got into a wee bit of trouble because we, we wanted a punchy name and it was the murder house. And we subtitled it, How We Used to See the Dental Nurse. So it was in the past, but as soon as we <coughs> I showed, presented it to the dental uh, school, they said, well, you can't call it the murder house. Um, we're not dental nurses anymore. We're dental technicians and no kids call it the murder house. So I checked with my daughters and I said, what do you call it? And they said, the murder house. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we're going to have to wear this. And, and what we found, though, was that the... Um, it was the old treadle drills, you know, before they got the machine drill. It was really painful. Um, so I, I actually never had, I, you know, my experience was relatively good at the dental nurse. Um, but yeah, it was quite a painful experience and there was that thing about, and everyone knew it was about being called out in class. You, know, you are going to the dental nurse. <laughs> so it's that sort of whole cultural experience in there. Um, this was one we did uh, with the Dunedin Sound. Um, it was originally called the Stomping Ground, I'm not quite sure, but we called it the Dunedin Sound Scene. Um, and playing on the word that we, we looked at their posts, their magnificent posters that were done by band members and lots of them hand drawn. Uh, the album covers, the album art, which is almost lost now. You know, we've, I've talked to various designers about the CD isn't a great format for a great image, whereas a 12 inch uh, record, you've got a lot of creative space there. Um, and what this exhibition did, aside from putting a bollard in the middle, which we constantly filled with posters from OUSA to, you know, uh, tell people about gigs that were on in town, um, we got, I think we got the highest visitor numbers for the Hocken at this, because, it, you know, it's got a great research collection, it's relatively traditional, they've got a core group of people that came, but we had all the band members, all the roadies, um, you know, all the people that were fans at the time, and then young people who knew, you know, various newer versions of Flying Nun, and, things like that coming to see this exhibition and we also had music playing in the gallery and yeah it was, it was just a great opportunity to um, work again with the community um, and sort of pull some of this stuff out of the archives. Um, this was yeah, I guess a bit close to my field in terms of it's a history of design in Otago, um, the first uh, design school in 1870, the first design school in New Zealand actually. Um, and the remarkable David Con Hutton, who came out to teach art and design in Dunedin and the entire Otago region. Um, he had nine children, um, three of whom went on to become designers or architects. Um, and we had this sort of space where th this was a wee student's illustration, very small, uh, the, the floral pattern that comes out, and it was just one of those beautiful little uh, student works. And we blew it up because we wanted to take people into design. And, and this was a way of separating this space, which was largely about uh, David Conn Hutton and his family. Um, that's a portrait of his wife there and his 
sun. Uh, both of those are quite freakly surreal. Um, there's a you know, beautiful portrait of his wife, you know, truly loves her, but in a, in a, there's a certain uneasiness about the way she stands in the sort of bush entrance and the boy similarly in the, thing, in the <coughs> bush there. Um, and then I guess I've got to come back to, to Manawa again with um, the Savage Crescent exhibition, which was something I've always been interested in, uh, the history of state housing in New Zealand. Um, and that there was this remarkable um, community just along the road, which Tony kindly took me to on the way in again tonight, and uh, when I arrived, sorry. And what I liked about it was uh, it was a perfectly preserved, you know, probably the best example of a full-scale social housing development in New Zealand. But there was a community living there, and there were only about 10% or something with state houses at the time, the rest had been sold privately, and the, there'd also been this remarkable uh, collaboration with Historic Places Trust where they worked on heritage guidelines that didn't enforce them but <coughs> encouraged people to preserve and retain. And the community had a very strong pride in, in the area. And I thought, well, that, that, that's a really good opportunity to build into this community and work with a uh, student I had, Alice Lake Hammond, on the design. <coughs> And we came up with this sort of three-part system of the past, present and the future because I very much wanted this to be a, um, a starting point to engage with that community as well as looking at their, their, their heritage of the architecture and the community. And we did this great plan for upstairs and I think they liked it so much they gave us a much bigger space downstairs. And if as any of you know who designed for one space and switched into another, unless you intentionally design it in a modular way, it's a bit of a nightmare to... <laughs> Reconfigure, but again, it made us rethink our ideas. Um, and Alice did, uh, you know, some pretty intensive, and I, probably for panels these days, those are quite long. Um, but it was a big story to tell, and we we did want to do it. But we also had some nice collaborations with people I was working with at Otago. Uh, Nicola was another master's student was looking at inclusive playground design, and there's a playground in the area which. Um, hasn't been touched for a while and we thought well this would be a nice way to introduce some of the new developments and playgrounds and you know to create, create a kind of fantasy playground a little bit of interactivity with that playhouse um, and Mick Abbott who's a sort of landscape designer want to look at uh, the, the location of these houses on a site map and also there's a wee interactive game with the houses where you could redesign the spaces because at the same time as this um, it was the centenary of state housing and they were redesigning the state house. And basically the whole premise for these houses, the nature of our families, the size and shape of people, it changed dramatically as had the way we lived. And these houses, you know, weren't quite the way we would understand or perhaps desire our houses to be. So this was a way to engage people into house design in a very simple um, game format. And I guess this for me, even though these photos again are pretty rubbish, uh, was one of the big successes when we came up uh, with Alice and um, we, we were looking at the collection, preparing and talking about the exhibition. We took a drive, um, got out to the field, drove around Savage Crescent and Alice, one of her part-time things was a, she's a VJ, a video DJ, she took a camera and we just filmed a loop of the Crescent, you know, because it's a oval like that and we got it and we ran it on the slightly curved wall and this the one thing I love about, you know, curations and, and particularly exhibition design, that, most design you never get to see what people, how people respond and react to your design, but in an opening you do. And I just saw this group of people gathering around, you know, and this is the street that a lot of them probably you know, drive around, park their car, and they love just seeing it in the round and, and sort of representing it back to them. I thought that was one of the focal points and we had it very close to the entrance to kind of lure people in. But also for those people who went from there to say, well, hey, it's just over over there. So, you know, you, you don't have to come into the museum, you can go and visit it and it's now some great interpretive signage um, out there now. I thought I'd just throw in this one. Um, th this is an exhibition I did at the Christchurch Art Gallery uh, on Leo Bensimon. Uh, I only have install shots. Um, this was one I worked on for about six or seven years and um, it, it, it opened two weeks before the big quake and, and I guess it was a marvellous collaborative event. Everything that I'd set up the year before had gone west. The archives that were meant to be in the Macmillan Brown had disappeared and been put in the wrong box. And the team out there basically scoured the archives for a day and a half. I couldn't find them and then I went and said, please, can you let me look one more time? They pulled out one box with somebody else's name on it and opened it up. There was everything 
I ordered and it just got mixed up in the crate. And everyone in the museum um, was incredibly helpful in a situation where the archives I'd had at the Caxton Press got dropped in a, a warehouse and I went there with my kids for an entire day sifting through 400 boxes until I found the archives I'd put there a year before under the tea kettle the, uh, all the things that I, the, box, the one box I didn't check, and there were all the materials and that actually um, shrunk wrap them and kept them aside for me and moved them out of the building, which collapsed. Um, so it ran for two weeks, uh, and I was happy with that. Uh, you know, just the experience, again, it's, it's the collaborative experience and how people, um, the registrar was magnificent in this case because things were changing at the last moment, and they were just going, hey, whatever, sign it off. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it because, you know, we had to do this show. And, I remember putting the last label up as the preview came through in the back room and I couldn't see because the lighting was down. I was going, that's not straight. Like, huh? Who cares? Ran at the back and got changed. Um, so all those experiences um, between now and obviously tomorrow has you know, moved on and uh, evolved and changed in the uh, almost 10 years since, since I left. Um, uh, but again, people are still, I, I think, very much at the centre of this place. Okay, well the second um, section of this talk keep going, is discovery. Um, I guess there's a number of questions that I had about exhibitions and how they work and Tony encouraged me I think to, to, to co-write this article about Savage Crescent um, but actually about community exhibitions and, and how we make them happen and you know what works and what doesn't. Um, and I guess that, that was one of the conclusions we had. Um, you know, looking back at all those community exhibitions, I thought they'd worked very well, but I felt that the communities wanted to participate, but they found the museum the exhibition process difficult to negotiate. They weren't quite sure what, what we did. Um, and then there was the actual practicalities of getting people in and going out to them and getting public meetings and how do we do that. And there was a wee footnote I put into this, and I didn't realise until I reread it, well, it's beyond the scope of the hardcore. It seems to be a role for designers in assisting the community in cases of prior consultation with visualising like exhibition outcomes in the form of graphic scenarios or storyboards. Um, well, Alice and I wrote uh, this article in the Design Journal, looking at the design process. And I guess this was one of the other issues I had about was the relationship between curators and designers. And the worst case scenario is curator, curator spends all this time coming up with a great concept and leaves the designer about a week to put it together, that never happened in my time, I swear. Um, and we were trying to bring those two closer together and in a way the Savage Crescent exhibition was an experiment with me giving Alice ideas and concepts that I'd got from research saying, I'm not sure what to do with these, but here, have a look at them and what can you come up with? And she would come back with designs and I'd go, oh, oh I can work with that. That's, that can actually help me shape my research perhaps a little bit faster and we can work together. So it was about closing the gap, bringing us together. But we, again, we got to this thing about, you know, it all comes to that point of the eye and it's all about the exhibition but it's the audience and their interpretations and what they take away and their experience that that, that is still the most important thing. Um, and there's a wee description from Ralph Applebaum uh, who was obviously involved in the design of Papa and I did a little bit of research on how that design came about which was an incredibly complex process but quite interesting in a lot of ways. <coughs> and, you know what he did he kind of saw himself as a you know, he, put, he just put himself in the shoes of the visitor and said, what, what would they take out of that? And that was one of our conclusions that this creative interdisciplinary role for design and bridging the gap between expert knowledge and satisfying an increasing desire for democratic participation can be seen as an important factor in the design. And I guess what it made me realise is that you know, the outside museums, uh, libraries, galleries, uh, sometimes perceived as traditional and conventional, but actually for me they've always been a site of quite innovative design practice and, and new thinking and, and I think yeah, it was, it was kind of really interesting to go through this process to acknowledge that and this, this role for design which Roberto Viganti calls a brokering of language, you know, sometimes design is that way in which we can cross those disciplines and talk to each other. Um, this was another piece of research that sort of followed from ours and used a little bit of that article. It was a Master's in Applied Sciences at um, our Master in Information Science in Oregon. It's basically a giant literature review of recent um, exhibition design literature. And if you look at the thesis, it's 200 pages. The first 170 are very 
much like a thesis, 12 point times New Roman double spaced. And um, then there's this lovely colour section at the end where she summarises her findings into those sections about the importance of experiential learning, which we talked a lot about yesterday, interactivity, effect, cognition, narrative, self-concepts, context, engagement, and usability. And this thing that designers need to demystify how we design for user experiences. Um, time here. Um, this, I guess, was an um, important experience for me, was attending a design anthropology workshop in these two countries, Denmark and Aberdeen in 2010. There were 50 PhD students from design and 50 from anthropology and archaeology, and it was hosted by Tim Ingold, a very um, <coughs> well-known anthropologist at Aberdeen at the start, and he said, this is about design anthropology, and I'm not going to tell you what that is. <laughs> and there was, you know, you could, there was a bit of unease in the room, and then this remarkable Dutch designer called Jellia puts up his hand and says, well, I'm a designer, and I, I want to learn from anthropologists about how to deal with people, and, and you, you, you want to learn from me how to intervene. He said, there's going to be some pain in the room. Because <laughs> <laughs> he said, we're all going to have to give something up. And I thought that did sort of nail it, but you know, but we had a week in uh, Aberdeen, uh, you know, developing a much stronger understanding of anthropology. Um, Tim Ingold taking us out and looking at crofters, uh, cottages and, and, and turning into a performance, showing the, the, the size of the doorway to this, this ruin and taking us through this area and telling us about the experiences of the people who lived there. And then we moved to uh, Denmark and the Sonderborg Participatory Innovation Centre. This is very much a design business hub. Uh, design school on, on this side, uh, state-of-the-art concert theatre in the middle, and business park at the far end. So business meets design um, in the space, and they do participatory innovation. Right. Well, I think I'll, I might just skip over this. And I, I do want to say, because I think it's important that I do actually tell you what participatory design is. Um, uh, and that, to do that, I am going to read a little bit, just because um, it might be, it'll be clearer that way, I hope. Um, originally called Cooperative Design, Participatory Design developed in Scandinavia in the 1970s and sought worker influence on the development and use of computers in the workplace. A partnership was formed between workers, consultants and design researchers to develop a platform for worker influences on the use of new technologies. This was generally conducted in collaborative groups working within locally available resources with the aims of creating a better working environment, which was tested out in practice. This resulted in a number of technical agreements that provided workers with a direct say in the development and use of new technology and a number of union education programs. Unlike system development in the United States, which focused on technical, refining technical specifications, the Scandinavian experiments incorporated a user perspective to challenge the rationalist tradition of computer programming. The second generation of design research in the 1980s focused on the development of computer support to enhance skill development and product quality, identifying dehumanisation as a central problem. The Scandinavian research and design project, um, research and development project Utopia ran for five years between 1985 and 1986 and anticipated the radical changes that were to affect the communication design industry over the next decade with the introduction of personal computers. Researchers and computer system developers work with typographers to enhance their skills to develop better typographical quality in newspapers. The research was coordinated by the Swedish Centre for Working Life in collaboration with the Nordic Graphic Workers Union, with reference groups from Denmark, Finland, um, Norway and Sweden. Their overall aim was to develop powerful skill-enhancing tools for graphic workers, with an equal focus on technical and social aspects. Due to the range of participants involved, there was a mutual learning process while participants established a common knowledge platform. There was also a strong desire from the workers for rapid, concrete results that matched their work experience. In 1982, the state-owned printing firm Lieber provided the opportunity to try out the ideas developed on their own in-house system. This led to the establishment of a makeshift technology lab, and these photos are from uh, there to provide a common working environment for workers and researchers to simulate and experiment with the integration of page layout and image processing. These involved storyboards and mock-ups of work processes, uh, a simulated workstation for developing new computer tools, and the use of maps to describe various work organisations. 
After evaluation of the systems and the work environment, recommendations were made for development and a strong foundation was established for ongoing negotiations between workers and management about computer implementation. The end result was described by researchers as a commercial failure, but a knowledge success. Um, by way of anecdotal comparison with New Zealand, I interviewed a number of printers as part of my own research project where the introduction of new technology was generally met with early retirement from skilled compositors with considerable experience, as there was little in the way of transitional support, let alone active work participation in the process. Um, the third generation research analysed the strengths and weaknesses of user participation and built up a theoretical framework premised on social constructivism. This also involved a move away from system descriptions to the incorporation of more game-like design sessions, including <coughs> imagined futures and fantasy to encourage creative contributions from participants. Participatory design was taken up in a number of countries, but in the United States the focus shifted from workplace organisational issues and self-development to the development of methodologies for involving users in system development and design and improvement in product quality. This was a distinct evolution from the user-centred design where research and design was done on behalf of users in controlled and focused experimental settings, compared to participatory design where it was done in collaboration with users. However, in the US, more reliance was placed on ethnography and has to a degree been overtaken by design anthropologists. Intel, for example, employs um, uh, more than 200 design anthropologists to research user experience and user interaction. And I did just put up, uh, you might recognise Will I Am, who's been appointed their Director of Creative Innovation. When I was searching for a photograph, I came up with that Future of Museums blog spot that considered you know, where people for museums of the future might, what fields might they be drawn from? So it was just a kind of an interesting aside. Um, while the methodology has evolved over the past 40 years, designers and users working in equal partnership has been a central tenet of participatory design, as has acquiring knowledge through action rather than through research alone, and the iterative process of multi-concept creation that enables communication and refinement. The Scandinavian tradition is premised on the empowerment of users and the embodiment of tacit knowledge and invisible practices in tangible prototypes that provide participants with a sense of active creative contribution. It is an all, also an important process for developing cultural understanding and empathy as there needs to be a shared understanding of needs between designer and user. In terms of commercial design application, the quality and efficiency of the design process is improved if users are incorporated from the start rather than as a means of evaluating a finished design. It also creates user buy-in, which increases the chances of the final design outcome being more real, well received by the users that helped create it. It is participatory design's democratic and inclusive approach that aligns well with the goal of social inclusion in the museum. The Design Council defines participatory design as a set of methods used by designers to engage non-designers, which results in solutions being created collaboratively and the delivery of responses more appropriate to end users' needs. Users, or in the case of museums, visitors, um, are regarded as experts in determining their own needs. And this can be as challenging for curators as it has been for the design profession to relinquish some creative control. The key motivations behind the new museology and participatory design are the same, as the new museology calls for greater user involvement, participatory design provides methods for activating creative community collaboration and exhibition concept development, design and evaluation of existing museum exhibitions. More recently it has also been used to focus on exhibitions designed for user participation once the exhibition is open. Um, Time here. I've got two case studies which I might just skip over, but I can provide uh, the article that describes these two case studies the Vaza Ship Museum in Stockholm and Museum of Science and Technology. And they used, in one case, participatory design to evaluate the current exhibitions and you could use this to look, look at how they could be uh, better designed in the future to meet certain groups, particularly young people. Uh, teenage audiences um, and the other one was about the restoration it was about the conservation of the Swedish warship which was quite a complex subject and a long project and they wanted to get the, the, um, you know, the right tone and balance for this information to the young audience they were targeting 
and they used, you know, in one case two workshops and the other four or five uh, with a range of um, support for it. So, that's a definition from the literature about <coughs> design that I like because it involves representatives of also users, but possibly future users, those people who haven't been to the museum. Uh, that's from within the profession. Um, assumes that users should play an active role in the design process. So the final phase is prototyping. Um, this is a project we did in the Manitoto, uh, working with um, Vitalize Manitoto. We wrote a report, uh, in fact my colleague Michael Finlay, uh, the student of ours wrote this one, about sort of auditing what they had in the Maniatoto in terms of their cultural heritage resorts. Um, and then we gave them a final report um, last year. But we used participatory design um, to explore some of the developments that could be made in the area, and this was in 2011, I think. And we wanted to carry out some workshops, but because we'd never done them before, we thought we'd try them out on our own students first. I know we did have ethical approval uh, for all this, and we wanted to look at outside spaces in the Maniatoto and how they could be developed. So Josh Urelli developed this project to look at outside study spaces at the university using students so we could try out the workshops, see how they worked. Um, and this was the process that they went through uh, to design alternative study spaces outside the main libraries and you know, the university provides a number of study spaces but they were looking at outside study spaces. And food's really important in these kind of workshops, um, keeps everyone happy. Um, they're very much hands-on, they run for about an hour and a half and at the end of it you move through these three phases but the last phase is prototyping so all those ideas that you hear in community consultation that are very interesting but a little bit undefined have to be made into tangible prototypes and by prototypes I mean you know, using cardboard, paper, pins, sellotape, blue tape, you know, basic materials but once it's turned into a tangible form it can then be evaluated and discussed and looked at um, and we came up with a range of solutions uh, just for outdoor study spaces. This was a strategy for Mania Toto. Um, he had a three phase step strategy, he was quite ambitious about seeing the place before you get to Ran Ranfurly in particular. Getting people to stop there, it has a bypass that you can miss it. Um, the town's response to this was to put up a sign saying, feeling tired, stop in Ranfurly which we didn't think was as enticing as it could be <laughs> into the city. Uh, and um, so the, he, picked, he picked the one thing about getting people to stop. And you know, people do stop here, maybe go to the toilets a brief time and then they move on because it does take you to the rest of Central Otago. And he wanted briefs for you know, shelters and uh, to implement, but we want to use this participatory design process. He developed a number of cards which basically drew out people's you know, experiences or uh, knowledge of the place, you know, why go, why stay, why return and sustainability was a key theme, so how could, how could that be implemented. And these are like little birthday cards, um, there's a question on the inside and a space for people to write so all the answers get collected so you've got all your data captured at the end of that phase. And then we get them prototyping uh, solutions and, and while people often say they can't draw, you just show them a really bad stick figure and they go, I can do that. <laughs> and they can draw and they can make things and they can turn their ideas. And this was done in the local rugby club rooms, uh, again we provided food. And that was the you know, eight, nine, ten solutions that we created, uh, placed on an axis from this group of around 15 people from within the community about how they wanted to shape uh, their space. These were some of the developments that Joshua did afterwards, but using the same method. So this is actually a bike stand, a rest area for picking <coughs> tables. But, uh, these are bike stands, but they're actually paper clips. Um, and there would be movable racks, because when you have a bike on the rail trail, you have panniers and bags and you need to put them down. If the bike's there, you might need to slide those along. And then he looked at placing it in a certain area in the town, which the community identified as being derelict and in need, but it's a beautiful bridge from the rail trail into the main street of the town and he looked at developing <coughs> these three areas for kids, bike park and motorists and uh, that th this could also be developed incrementally, you know, the community could decide, th th there's a lot of variety in ways in which this could be built and developed from low cost to high cost and they could determine which aspects uh, they want to do and the, and the more that they stay in these prototypical forms the more that people engage with them and, and then kind of redesign them and fit them to their own needs and resources. Um, 
about two minutes. So um, I'll just take you through this project where uh, this is Ruth Elliott, uh, who's just finished her Master of Applied Science, um, applying uh, participatory design to uh, the Renfrewley Art Deco Gallery, and that's a wee model of there. This is the start of a journey, I suppose. This is us in the studio. Those, that's our participatory design kit. Fits into two boxes. Um, and then we set off, we stopped at the road sign. That was one of the signs we designed. We it was a little bit more evocative. We're almost at Renfurley rather than, are you feeling tired of going to crash the car? Stop at Renfurley. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is just the chapters from her master's thesis. Uh, the opportunity, this is the remarkable, really preserved Art Deco um, refreshment rooms and milk bar. It's actually a hybrid between a you know, railway refreshment room and a milk bar, so it sits beautifully in that sort of 40s, 50s period. Um, and the second chapter looks at the gallery itself, how, because it's been going for 10 years, what it does, um, the layout, the design, precedent, we looked at Toy 2, because it had just been opened, and a few other international examples. Then the participatory design process, these are all examples from workshops, and then her scenarios for a participatory museum there. And these are just some shots from the workshop that give you a sense of what we're doing. You know, a lot of post-it notes, uh, positives and negatives of the gallery. You know, that's a really good way to start. What are people? These are the people that volunteer and work on here. You know, for an hour, two hours, ten hours. They know the place intimately. They know who comes in and out, and they do know what's good and what's not. And so we could draw that out and we capture all the data, and then we've got them to sort of look at various scenarios that we did on that. Um, what do you call it? It's an art. Thing where you join pictures together, the exquisite corpse where you draw a bit of the picture and fold it over. So we did this with their concepts so they couldn't see the previous ones and then we open them all out for them and they get revealed the package of scenarios. We had that lovely bench there which we could just keep putting the work up, so looking at various spaces within the gallery on the floor plan and what, what things could go in there. These were the interpretive themes that we developed after research, about 10 of them, because largely it's object based with very little interpretation. But we wanted them to tell us which themes they thought, you know, they told us they wanted more interpretation, but they didn't know what. And we also created a few extra cards because they came up, once we gave them eight or nine, they came up with another four or five. Uh, and then we just gave them this plan, the floor plan, gave them pens and little bits of foam pour to place on there to tell us how this gallery would be designed. And it was a blank piece of paper when we started. And it just got fuller and fuller and you, you could, the, the, oh, you know, I was just standing back watching the, the engagement, you know, the discussion that was going on between these people, they're all key stakeholders there and that they could create this gallery space and completely fill it up. And then our last trick I suppose was I, I made these little paperclip people where I, I said oh, I'm a visitor and I'm coming in here and I said what's this? And they would tell me and they would just say something like video. So a video of what? And they would they'd be able to tell me the story and so we'd annotate the drawing. And I took the visitor all through the gallery and my little visitor was really happy. <laughs> uh, so I said, well that's, you know, we've, we've prototyped um, a lot of potential, you know, development opportunities for the gallery. And including, we had a wee debate at the end and we'd done a wee bit of branding uh, for them, uh, whether it was going to be Ranfurly Art Deco or Art Deco Ranfurly. So I had the two bits of card and I folded them up and said, well, which way round would you like it? And they went, oh, it's Art Deco Ranfurly. And so, you know, it was just, once you've created these materials, um, it's very easy to work with the community and, and you can kind of plan it, but a lot of the time it's very responsive in the process. You, you've got to step back, you know, look, let the participants take, take the lead. And then we packed it all up in the car and, and, and took it home. Um, these were some of the design outcomes. It was really scenario based, but these are going to be utilised by the gallery. Uh, branding, and the brand comes from this wee fence at the back of the gallery that you know, Ruth noticed, and so that's really beautiful. And um, you know, she did a lot of research. And this, this became really important. It, it was Art Deco as a revitalisation project in, in the 80s, driven by one woman in particular, but it was also the only you know, museum in that area, and it came out very strongly that their local stories weren't being told. So, you know, how could we do in a very simple way, you know, begin to tell some of the community stories. And I'm going to try not really. Uh, I think this is a summary from her thesis. This is user-centered design where the designer is sort of intervenes 
between the user, but participatory is about designers and users working together, and that could be curators, if we're all designers, <laughs> educators, curators, all of us working with users to come up with an end design. Um, oops, we'll just give you that. That's from the newspaper just recently, the Art Deco Committee, you benefited from me from a piece by Ruth Owen, this piece is now useful and fine when we think about the future of the gallery. So I was, I was really happy with that as a result, and they're going to implement um, some of those developments in the community. And her thesis and another one by one of our students is, will all be online by the end of the year if you want to dig in a more depth. So I think that's where we'll leave it. Oh. Yeah. Just from the last. <laughs> I think uh, that was Alice wrote that from Reflections on MA. Imagine if our ideas budget was as big as our conservation budget. If our ideas incorporate our communities and the people we work with, that's a really good way to expand our ideas budget. And my definition of exhibition design is individual enterprise and collective surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so thank you.